Hello, this is international football commentator Derek Ray from ESPN and EA Sports. You're listening to Gol Bazan Podcast. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Gobazan's part one of the previews into Iran's World Cup opponents in Group B for Qatar 2022. I'm Samson Tamajani. Today we spotlight the UEFA playoff teams. This will feature our interviews with experts on Scotland, then Wales, then Ukraine. Guests include commentator Derek Ray, Clint Jones from the 94th Minute, and Andrew Todos from Zoya Londonsk. We hope you enjoy and share this as well as subscribe to us on YouTube, any social medias, and wherever you get your podcasts. That's Safi with it, and there's the moment, Tonami, the substitute. And it was an own goal, Ali. Okay, I'm joined uh, by Derek Ray, a very good friend of the, the podcast, um, obviously commentator for EA Sports FIFA, uh, Bundesliga, La Liga, uh, will also be in Qatar. Uh, for the World Cup. Uh, Derek, very good to have you on our podcast. Thanks for inviting me, Arya. Good to be with you. Yeah, it's great to be speaking to a fellow Scot, uh, someone who yes. obviously uh, massively, you know, well-known around the world, someone who obviously, as, uh, as I mentioned, uh, commentated in the previous World Cup uh, for the Iran-Morocco and Iran-Spain match, if I'm not mistaken. Iran-Portugal. Portugal. Portugal. It's fantastic. So obviously, you've been there, um, and, you know, it was great to, to hear your voice, obviously, commentating on those matches. Give us a little bit about that and how that went down. Well, I enjoyed the Iran games. I thought they were a bit unlucky in the end when you think about it. I mean, some people might say lucky in the first game based on the timing of the goal more than anything, and perhaps unlucky in the Portugal match. But um, it was great to see a football nation develop as Iran did in that World Cup. And I think eyes were opened as to what the potential might be. Because at the start, I don't think too many people who don't follow Iranian football closely gave them much of a chance. But they more than held their own in that group, I thought. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, it, it was, uh, I think, a, a time where Iran kind of had to show themselves to the world. Uh, but this time around, Iran are a group of teams like the US, England, who... Uh, have massive audiences around the world and you know it can be a big uh, you know big for Iran in terms of the eyes being on the games what do you think of that uh, going into this group yeah I think now the perceptions have changed a bit you know I listen a lot to obviously pundits in England um, within the UK and also in the USA and you know, if we were to go back to 1978, and I'm old enough to remember 1978 when Iran were the same group as the Netherlands, Peru and Scotland. Back then, there was a kind of a dismissive attitude about Iran. Nobody really thought that they had the wherewithal to do anything in the group. Of course, they got a draw against Scotland and a deserved draw, really. Um, and you look at the situation now, and I think in the USA, for example, um, People have respect because they remember what happened in 1998 at the World Cup when Iran defeated the USA. And, you know, they are not the, um, the team that everybody expects to go and beat up on in this World Cup. I, I think they are there as a team that can genuinely hold out hopes of making it through to the next phase. Absolutely. Um, obviously, here you speak about Scotland, mainly with, you, with yourself. Scotland has to play Ukraine in June. Uh, that game hopefully will go ahead. Uh, if they do get past Ukraine, they'll go and play um, the fellow Brit British side Wales. Um, how do you see these playoffs going? Well, first of all, I think we're entering the world of the unknown with regard to these playoffs. And I say that, of course, following on from what we've all 
taken in, you know, the horrific scenes of war in Ukraine. And for the longest time, I think many of us felt it was almost not practical to think of Ukraine taking part in this playoff. But as we speak now, it looks as though that is going to happen, Scotland against Ukraine on the 1st of June. And nobody can really know what state of health, and I'm choosing my words carefully, Ukraine will be in to play in a game of that magnitude. Maybe it can inspire players, but preparation-wise, can you be where you would want to be as a high-performance athlete? I, I'm not sure, I, and I don't think anybody really knows. And I must say, as a Scot, it's a slightly uneasy feeling that you have going into a game like that, because Scotland last made it to the World Cup back in 1998, an entire generation, dare I say, your generation, Arya, has lived through this period of not ever knowing what it's like for Scotland to be at a World Cup. And that's just wrong because, I mean, Scotland is a football country. It is the original football country. England likes to claim it on its own, but really you can make a strong case that both England and yeah, Scotland absolutely. yeah, had, had, a, had a big say, uh, co-equal say in the, the foundation of the game and the early organisation of the game. But um, I think Scotland would have to be favourites if you were looking at this in pure football terms. They have home advantage. They are going to have time to be ready for it. It's going to be at the end of their season. That could, of course, be a disadvantage as well because sometimes national teams really struggle when the long season has just finished and you have to sort of start again. Um, the world will be with Ukraine in that game. I, I think there's no doubt about that. And, and that's why I use the word uneasy um, when it comes to Scotland, because the groundswell of support will be there for Ukraine to try to make it through. And then, of course, Wales have the advantage of being able to wait and watch, see what happens at Hamden, and then take on the winners just four days later. So Wales are rightly the favourites, but I'm not necessarily convinced it's going to be a, a coronation for them. Obviously, uh, hopefully, Scotland does go through. We'd, we'd like to see that. And obviously, that would mean um, Group A would be uh, Scotland, Iran, uh, USA and, and England. Um, again, England and Scotland will be in the same group, the same as they were in the Euros. For, for Scotland, uh, coming up against likes of the US, England and, and Iran, how do you see that going for them in Qatar? Well, I think, first of all, if Scotland make it, they'll be happy to be there you know, above all other factors, because 24 years is such a long time. It's, it's far too long. And so the draw is almost secondary. But what I do think is, and I'm speaking as a Scot here, that if Scotland were already in the World Cup, if they had made it through these two difficult uh, playoff hurdles, I think they would have reason to believe that it's a, a doable task. You know, it, it's certainly not the case that Scotland are favourites to finish second. I don't know that there is a clear favourite to finish second, to be honest, in this group. I think England are the favourites to win it. And I think their, their history, their recent history, especially in major tournaments, um, would speak to that. And so I think it stands to reason that the others in the group can scramble for second place. So, you know, I, I think the, the order of the games... Is something that's interesting. Scotland would play the USA first, they'd play Iran second, and then England third. Now that could have some advantages and disadvantages. Um, I speak to a lot of Americans, obviously um, working for an American media company and ESPN, and they're feeling pretty confident, I have to say. They're feeling as though they're going to get off to a winning start, you know, whether it's uh, Scotland, whether it's Wales, whether it's Ukraine, and then they're ready to have a, a crack at England. And of course, they feel with, uh, with Iran, it's a bit of a grudge match for them because of the 1998 factor. But staying with Scotland, if it were to be USA first, I think it would be very important for Scotland to take something from that game, um, a draw at a minimum, which you know might be acceptable. And then the Iran game becomes gargantuan. The only thing that worries me as a Scot, Arya, is um, going back to 1978, that Iran game was the pesky game in the middle as well. It was the second game. And you know things are very different now. Back in 1978, Scotland went into that World Cup on a wave of unjustified optimism. You know, we were living in a different period when we didn't really get to see 
videos of other teams. And the assumption was Scotland are going to absolutely thrash Iran. Why would they not? I mean, We're here to win had, the World Cup. They had some great players, Scotland, back then, for sure. They you did. Yeah, absolutely. They did. But I think there was, and Ali McLeod was the manager. He was a great sort of um, evangelist, if you like. He was somebody who, who really believed in accentuating the positive, but maybe didn't do his homework on Iran. And Scotland were terrible in that game. Uh, Iran got their equaliser. And, um, you know, I, I think Scotland got their, their just desserts, it, it's fair to say. So um, I think going in now, you know, there's an awareness that Iranian players are, are good technically. And, um, you know, they've qualified for another World Cup. And you don't do that by being a a terrible team and Scotland haven't been there since 1998. So, so it's a very different sort of juxtaposition of, um, you know, who's the favorite and who's not. And genuinely, I wouldn't know who would come out on top in a game like that between Scotland and Iran, but the hope for Scotland would be that they'd have some sort of platform ahead of that Iran game. Of course, Iran will have played England in their first match. And I think the assumption would be England will probably win that game. You know, that that would be my feeling. I'm not going to say by by a big margin, but I would expect England to get off to a winning start against Iran. So that second game, if it were Scotland, um, of course, it could be Wales, could be Ukraine, would be just as important for Iran. And of course, uh, you'd have the USA in the last match and Scotland would be up against the old enemy England in, in their last game. Absolutely. Um, now, your perspective on the US national team, uh, you know, compared to the, you know the previous years, uh, how do you see them getting on? They're a very young team, and there's kind of a bit of a swagger about them. Um, I, maybe this is a bit unfair, but I, I notice that they have a lot of younger followers who are convinced that their players are on the cusp of becoming true world stars, that they have the potential to be world-class stars. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'm just a bit longer on the tooth and, and I sort of um, take some of that talk with a pinch of salt. I think they're a good team, uh, but I think there are some weaknesses there as well. And it's a strange mixture of players. You know, you have some very good ones like Christian Pulisic, like Weston McKenney, to name but two, you know, who play football, obviously, at a high level for for top clubs, um, and you have others who play in Major League Soccer, and Major League Soccer is a good level as well, but it's not Chelsea, and it's not Juventus, and, you know, we can go down the list of, of some of the, the other clubs that the U.S. players are playing for these days. So I think the, the fact that they missed out on the World Cup in 2018 means that they're really trying to sort of make up for lost time, but we'll see how seasoned they are, and we'll see... You know, for example, if they were to play Scotland or Wales um, or Ukraine in, in the opening game, we'll see how streetwise they are um, a, a against some hardened professionals, uh, irrespective of who their opponents are. And the same would apply against England. I think England would be too strong for them, honestly. That's my opinion. And then, of course, Iran in the last game. But um, it's always interesting, I think, to get the perspective of people from that country because uh, I, I sense real confidence from U.S. fans. I think they believe that they are going to finish second in the group. Um, you know, whereas I, I don't think if you spoke to, and I'm talking to, well, I'm talking to a to a, an Iranian Scot, so um, talking to Iranians and Scots, Welsh people, uh, Ukrainians, I don't think there would be that same level of we are going to finish second in the group or we're going to be in the top two I'm convinced of it I think it would be more um, correct me if I'm wrong based on your own feelings it would be more um, we'll see how it all comes together but uh, this is a pretty even group once you get away from England. Coming on to, to Scotland again who do you think individually speaking are the biggest threats uh, that you know that they can you know that players that they can cause issues for these countries in, in Qatar? Well I think Scotland's are better than they've been for quite some time. And, you know, the, the individuals who I think we need to focus on are clearly individuals who are playing well in England, in the Premier League. And, of course, Andrew Robertson is one, uh, needs no introduction, Liverpool left back, but Scotland use him mostly as a left wing back, as, as an attacking, marauding player, because that's the setup that they've developed. This sort of came, if you like, from the fact that Scotland have Kieran Tierney as well from Arsenal, who is 
you know, a bit like Andrew Robertson in terms of his strengths. He can also play in central defence, and Scotland have tried to accommodate the two of them with Tierney sort of playing the slightly unusual kind of left-hand side of the, the back three, but going forward a bit more than a traditional left-sided uh, player in a back three would, and Robertson then two is outside. So uh, you get the picture. Scotland are quite left-sided in, in that sense. If you compare and contrast with the right-hand side, it's a lot weaker. And um, it remains to be seen who would play in the right wing back position. You know, it could be Nathan Patterson, but he's been injured, actually is injured as we speak. And Steve Clark, the manager, tends to like Stephen O'Donnell, who's an honest worker, but certainly not an international quality player. Somebody who will give it everything, but is that good enough at this sort of level? So Robertson, we mentioned. Tierney, we've mentioned. Scott McTominay, we have to mention as well. Manchester United, who's, again, a, a, a good, credible player. Um, Scotland have at times toyed with the idea of playing him on the right-hand side of a back three. Um, it's, it's a matter of sort of fitting these players into positions that are based on need for Scotland, even though he'd be better off in midfield, Scotland would be better off, you know, with him in midfield as well. But, um, you know, where is best? Because if you say you don't have Tierney, I mentioned him, he's also injured at the moment and actually a doubt for the playoff games as things stand at last check. So maybe you need McTominay in there as, as part of the back three, because, the other members of the back three are not quite of that same caliber. You know, Grant Hanley is, is somebody who, you know, is, is more experienced at international level than Stephen O'Donnell, but maybe has something in common with O'Donnell in terms of not being really a, a top level international player. Uh, Jack Hendry, a, a you know, younger defender who has shown signs of promise, but also has mistakes in him. So, you know, I think you're getting the picture here. We've got some, some good quality players by any judgment people like Robertson Tierney McTominay you've got others who you know wouldn't be getting into too many other national teams at the World Cup but then you have Billy Gilmore who is a rising talent he's very good on the ball I sometimes hesitate to go overboard um, talking about Gilmore because um, Scots as Scots we tend to get excited about him but if you watch international football most countries have a player like Billy Gilmore. You know, he, he's not unique. Um, he's unique as a Scot because we've never really in recent times had this sort of silky um, composed passer who can sit in deep midfield positions and, and play that game. Um, John McGinn is another one who I think, um, to me, falls in the category of core member of the team. Uh, again, very good Premier League player, uh, was a good player in Scotland before that, box-to-box -box type and has goals in him, sometimes spectacular goals. But once you get beyond that core, that's when I think you start to, to worry. And where I worry most of all is in attack. It's been a problem for Scotland for years. There has not been a, a Scottish striker. Um, we don't, for example, even have somebody like Sardar Osmun, who can be a striker, can play off the front, can, you know, can play in a few different positions, can be an attacking all-rounder. We're rather limited when it comes to, to choices. Um, in terms of players to, to lead the attack. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. And I think the problem is, and we saw this during the Euros last year, the problem is that you could only go to the well of Robertson and McTominay, et cetera, et cetera, so often. And teams, of course, have a way of neutralizing these players and others have got to step up. So it's, uh, it's going to be a big task for Scotland if they make it. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree with that. Uh, you mentioned Osmond, uh, obviously a player who just moved to Bundesliga at, at Bar Leverkusen, a guy who obviously had great time in Russia, you know, great career uh, in, playing in Champions League, playing in two World, uh, playing at a World Cup, playing in the Asian Cup, but has made this move to Bundesliga now. Um, how important do you think it is for him between now and November to really push on, uh, progress his career in the in that country, and and how do you think he will do come the World Cup? Well, I think, first of all, we need to say that he's had a, a difficult time. He's had an unlucky time of it, really, since he made the move to Leverkusen. And, of course, it was COVID, first of all, and then it was an injury. And it just seemed to be one setback after another. Uh, he wasn't probably going to get into the team initially anyway. They wanted to bed him in. When you have Patrick Schick, when you have Florian Wirtz, um, it's going to be difficult. But... 
they do have big plans for him. And they said straight away, Simon Rolfes and all the people on the sporting side at Leverkusen said, you know, we haven't just signed Osmond to be somebody to come and give Patrick Schick a rest every so often. We've signed him because he can do other things. He can play in other positions. Now, it, it's a good thing that they've signed him because Florian Wirtz, who's one of the brightest young playmaking figures in world football is going to be out until the autumn, maybe later. It's going to be touch and go for him for the World Cup. So that tells you everything from the, the Osmond perspective. He's going to get a lot of game time um, playing possibly, you know, across the front, if you like, the way Leverkusen line up. They're generally a 4-2-3-1 team. Schick, when he's fit, of course, is the, the man who leads the line. Other clubs greatly covet. Patrick Schick, uh, Leverkusen are adamant they're not going to sell. So Osmond um, has to fit in somewhere in that three behind the one. So I, I think it'll stand him in good stead. They're a very progressive club on the pitch. They move the ball around nicely at pace. And if you're an attacking player, you're heavily involved in the game. So it probably will have actually, in a strange kind of way, done him a bit of good to have just been able to observe and imbibe in a new country because it is a transition. You know, he's obviously a, a world football traveler, but, you know, Germany is a new country to him and he has to find his feet. And again, he, he really had had to do that while in, while ill and then injured uh, upon first joining. So, um, yeah, I look forward to the next few months. Uh, I think he's in the right place for his next development. Fantastic. Okay, uh, final question now for you, Derek, is regarding the group again prediction. Uh, let's just say, for example, <laughs> let's say Scotland do actually get through, right? Um, how, how do you see this uh, this standing uh, ending uh, come the end of all the matches? Well, I think this will be really tight. Um, I, I expect it to go right down to the last game, maybe the last kick. And... Um, I have to say, of course, as a Scot, that, that I really would hope Scotland could make it out of the group. I think England will win the group. I think what actually might work in Scotland's favour, funnily enough, is playing England last. I think in this case, it might not be the worst time to play England. I'm expecting that they'll have won the first two games by then. And Scotland might get them uh, when they're less obsessed with winning and who knows? We saw even at the last World Cup that sometimes uh, winning the, the group is not a, a good thing. Sometimes better to be second. So I'm pinning some hopes on that. I'm thinking Scotland will get something from the first game against the USA. Again, assuming Scotland qualify. And then that Iran match becomes really, really important. So um, I'm going to, if you push me, I'm going to say that uh, Scotland will beat the USA in the first game. They'll draw with Iran in the second and they'll nick a draw with England in the third. How about that? Five points for Scotland. I think, <laughs> I think every, every Scot would take that now. I'd take you? that. I'd take that for Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. Though. I'm not sure they'd be able to take uh, you know, all of those games without at least losing one of them, but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. No, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm being the optimist there. But, uh, <laughs> I, seriously, I think the group will be really tight. Yeah, I think, as you said, uh, the, the countries like the US, Iran, Scotland, whoever it is, gets through, those three countries probably be quite tight. You know, whoever gets, maybe a point against England could be the one who gets the second place team. So hopefully uh, it'll be an interesting uh, uh, watch come uh, November. Derek, I really appreciate your time. Uh, obviously, uh, if anyone uh, wants to, to follow you, they can find you on Twitter, am I right? Yes, they can find me on Twitter at Raycom, R-A-E-C-O-M-M. -M. Fantastic. We, we love hearing your voice on uh, on the FIFA uh, video game as well. You're doing a, a fantastic job. Are you going to be back on it for the next game as well? Well, I, um, I'm never allowed to say exactly like what say. I'm doing from game to game, but, right, right, uh, right. but I'm spending a lot of time in the recording studio at okay. the moment. So you can, you can take what you will from that. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much for that. And uh, we'll speak to you very soon. Thanks, Arya. Bale set. And Bale scores! Lift off for the Welsh in Cardiff. And yet again, it is Gareth Bale with a free kick who has given them the advantage in this playoff semi. I'm joined by Clint Jones from 94th Mate, who covers Welsh football on Twitter. It's so good to have you with us, Clint. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me on. No, it's our, our absolute pleasure. And I think um, it'd be great to get your view on, I guess, the Welsh national team, your chances mm -hmm. of qualification, and also, I guess, 
what you what you think of Iran, like your your emotions when that draw was was drawn, uh, just like our group um, as a whole. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess like, I think the best thing would be to jump in straight to um, what are your what are your kind of like thoughts for qualification because obviously Wales hasn't qualified yet. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, obviously, we've got the uh, we are in the, the UEFA Path A playoff, um, and we have to play the winners of either Scotland or Ukraine. Um, it's we're we're kind of in Wales. It's a little bit. It's, we're in a bit of an awkward situation because we're kind of we're very so near to the World Cup that we're actually looking at it and kind of half planning it, but we know that because we still got a playoff to play and Wales's sort of history of qualifying for World Cups hasn't been great. We're sort of looking at it with we're very sort of not counting our chickens yet. I guess it's the case, but uh, we were very excited when the group come out. Yeah, I mean the thing is, from I guess like. Uh... I, I prefer everyone that obviously knows from Golbazan. I, I've, I've grown up in the UK, mm-hmm. um, in England. And I guess like whenever I see Wales in big tournaments, they do, I think that maybe the recent ones, they do perform. Obviously you have Gareth Bale and you have other mm-hmm. like huge players that do come up in the big games. Um, so like, I guess from your, from your current squad and the end, I guess it was for your history from you know previous tournaments, what is that kind of, what's the general sort of consensus mm-hmm. within Wales, would you say? Um, I think we uh, obviously get for such a long time, Wales just didn't qualify for anything. And um, we've had so many near misses in the, in the past, obviously in the 70s and the 80s, and trying to qualify for the World Cup 94 and Paul Bowden's penalty. And then there's the Euro 2004, which is like really kind of big agonies of Welsh football. So for us to sort of now sort of kind of get over that hump a little bit by qualifying for the Euro 2016 and Euro 2020, 21 um was a huge thing for us it was it was that sort of like that first barrier to sort of uh, get wales to become i I guess take that next step as an international team because because Mm. for so long we'd not qualified for anything and obviously what happened in euro 2016 was just mind-blowing you know it it exceeded all our expectations for us for us to get to like you know our first ever european championships and being stuck in a kind of it was a difficult group for us to sort of win the group and then beat Belgium and Northern Ireland and obviously gets the semi-finals was just incredible um and then obviously that's carried on into Euro 2020 in the way that you know again we had I think a more difficult group and for us to get through that um especially considering our management situation which wasn't ideal at the time um it was uh, it, it was incredible and it's given us great sort of a confidence boost going into obviously world, this world cup qualifying mm. um i think the last world cup we were we got very near but um we were sort of stopped by uh the republic of ireland which was a big heartbreak for us because we were so confident we, we thought we could because of the, obviously the confidence we had from euro 2016 we thought we might be able to qualify again another welsh uh, sort of failure in, in world cup so for us to be so near this time it's sort of like we're confident we know we can beat anyone on our day but we still have this sort of uh issue where we just can't quite get over the line for the World Cup. And I think if we manage to get through that and overcome either whether Scotland or Ukraine, I think if we get that, our confidence will be sky high going to the World Cup. And naturally, because we've got England in, in, in our group, it's that's going to be the, the the fixture I think everyone will focus on again. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think if we look at, obviously, the other two new teams, obviously uh, Iran and the uh, United States, I think Wales would look at that group and think that you know it's it's fairly equal. I think between the three of us, um, if you have a look at the rankings, we're fairly equal. So yeah. It, so I think if we go into that World Cup, we wouldn't be afraid of anyone. We'd be going into it with a lot of a load of confidence. Obviously, our first appearance at the World Cup since 1958 as well. So it's going to have a huge implication and huge confidence for us. And I think we'll be going mm. into it with, I wouldn't say no real expectations. I think we'd look at that group and think, you know, we've got a good chance of getting through, but I think for us to be actually at the World Cup is a huge situation for us anyway. I think what will be important to know um, from, our, from our audience is that obviously mm-hmm. we know the, the key standout players within within the Wales squads, Gareth Bale, Aaron Ramsey. If you were to qualify, who are the kind of other players that we should look out for? Obviously Gareth Bale and Aaron Ramsey are the key ones, but uh, I, there's more to Wales than just them too. And so a, a player you might want to have a look at who's just hasn't long broken into the Welsh side is Brennan Johnson from uh, Nottingham Forest. Mm. He's a very young, talented player. He's only 20 and he is 
been one of the standout players for a very resurgent Nottingham Forest this year. He's really kind of come on leaps and bounds, and he's kind of he's looked at as the next big thing for us in Welsh football. I think he's sort of he. I think we're looking at him as the guy who will probably take Gareth Bale's place in the Welsh side to kind of be the main creator. And the way he he's been playing this year has given us great hope for that. Um, so I, I, another person would be Sorba Thomas as well from Huddersfield Town. He's another lad who is another exciting talent, another attacking player who we have great sort of excitement for and has come into the Wales squad and has been fantastic for us so far. And uh, again, he's another exciting talent. He's only 23. Another player who can give us a bit more of a attacking outlet on the wings. But I think as well as that, is you've got people like Harry Wilson at Fulham, who's having an amazing year you know, in the Championship. He is a bit more, obviously, more experienced than the two I just mentioned. He's got 35 caps. Um, but there's other people like Daniel James, obviously, at Leeds United. He is another type. He's still young. He's only 24. He kind of lacks a little bit of his of his finishing. I think if he could if he could perhaps finish a lot of his runs, he, he would be a better player. I think he'd be a very dangerous player. But on his day, he's he can tear any defence apart. I think what I'm most afraid of, I think what a lot of Iranian fans will be afraid of, is if Gareth Bale gets a free kick. Yeah. Um, within like 25 yards I think um, yeah that's when we'll, <laughs> we'll be praying <laughs> Clint I'd love to get your point of view on the group as a whole so obviously you've got yourself um, potentially you've got England Iran and the US as for you guys what's the kind of overall take on the group I think if you sort of took out the top seeds it would be a very good group for us because we look at it and go well all three teams are very equal and we've got a good chance of beating yourselves or the United States you know, and that's no disrespect to you two. It's just I think the way our confidence is at the moment, we could probably feel like we could beat anyone. But then I think when we got drawn with England, it's a bit of a case of oh no, not it's not them again, sort of aspect. <laughs> we had it in Europe 2016, and I think for ourselves, it's sort of like we know how good England are, um, and I feel f- a little bit. It's like. <sighs> If we qualify, it's sort of like we're stuck in England's group. It's not like we're, it's not Wales's group. We kind of would like to have a. We would have liked someone else. Some certainly as well. The fact that England are you know one of the best teams in the world right now, and and I hate to say that as a Welshman, um, but if you know for us, we feel that if we qualify, I mean, it would be. It's, it's going to be the biggest game, Wales, England Wales game, that's been in a long, long time. No doubt about that. And obviously, that's the last game in the group. And if England need points going into that final game, I don't think, you know, England will find a hand. Wales would give them a very tough game. And obviously there'd be nothing more that we'd love is to knock England out of the World Cup. I mean, that would be magnificent. But looking at the other two teams, we obviously, uh, if we qualify, would have the United States first. I think we'd be so confident for that. And we generally have started well in tournaments. Um, so for us, I've looked at, we looked at the United States. They haven't really qualified with a lot of confidence i mean they finished third in Concacaf, and they were quite lucky to get that even though they are the north american champions gold cup winners it's not a great american squad so um we played the friendly against them not too long ago and we, we did well against them as well so we don't really fear too much about that as for iran obviously there's, i think there's only been one game between wales and iran in, in our entire history so it's a little bit of an unknown. I think for ourselves, we are aware that I think the team that we're a little bit more fearful of because, uh, as you said, Iran have qualified for for the World Cup in such an impressive manner. I think we feel that if we're going to qualify for the knockout round, that will be the crucial game. And obviously being the second game in the group, I think for ourselves, that will be the must-win game, probably for ourselves and for Iran, I would imagine, as well. So, it, as I said, it could have been a lot more difficult, but I feel that I think probably if you look at England being the favourites to qualify out the group, I think the other three teams are probably fairly equal and it could be anyone's. Um, it might be a case of who gets the points from England makes it to the, to the knockout stages. Yeah, it's amazing to get your take on the Wales national team and you like, I guess, like where you kind of think it's going and I do wish you the best of luck. Clint, it's been amazing talking to you and thank you so much for coming on the podcast for Golbazan and uh, how can people stay in touch with you and your Twitter page? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me on. You can follow me on Twitter at, at the 94th min that's t-h-e 940-h-m-i-n and if you want to read what i'm doing i mainly write about welsh football but i've also written other stuff about other football around the world you can find me at the 94th minute.com great thank you so much no problem thank you let's watch yarmolenko 
Looks on Forsberg, plays this across, and check out! Goal! Okay, I'm joined by Andrew Todos from Zoria London. I had you on the podcast before uh, in the summer. Uh, Going to get you back on again in the summer, hopefully, uh, with Shahab Zahidi's situation. But good to have you back on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting a bit about things that hopefully will, will happen in the future with um, obviously Ukraine and yeah. Iran potentially meeting yeah yeah perfect uh hopefully hopefully for you guys you know you make it to the world cup what do you think the chances are of ukraine getting past scotland then uh, in june so taking into context what's going on right now which is evidently very serious the wars uh, you know been going on for over 40 days when we're recording this it seems like the match against scotland will happen That's the general consensus. It's going to happen in June at some point because players over the past month that have been playing for Dynamo Kiev and Shakhtar, they've not been allowed to leave, but just over the past few weeks they have been. So they're going to be training abroad, playing a few charity matches and all that kind of thing. And then it's expected that maybe towards May some point they will be talking um, about a training camp for the national team and then they'll be able to play Scotland and Wales if it comes to it. I guess the main question is, will Ukraine be fit mentally and physically to face uh, Scotland in June after everything that's happened over the past few months? Obviously, not all of the players play in Ukraine. Ukraine. So, you know, you've got Yarmolenko, Mikolenko, Zinchenko, loads of other, Malinovsky, everyone else who plays abroad, who have been playing fairly regularly over the past few months and, you know, getting into the swing of things. However, it will be the question of those players, like the Dynamo players, the Shakhtar players, whether they will be able to get up to speed and be ready for Scotland that have you know, that whole Scotland side will have been playing all season, more or less, um, regular football, etc. I think the general consensus in Ukraine is, um, even maybe if Ukraine aren't up to it 100%, they will have sort of like the, the whole country behind them in terms of like a unifying spectacle, that kind of thing. And hopefully that will help push them on to... Uh, yeah. to get to that World Cup playoff final against Wales and then on to the actual final tournament itself. Yeah. Um, looking at this group uh, for Ukraine, uh, you know, how do you see it uh, as like a, a challenge for them? Obviously, uh, England, tough side. We all know that you're from England. You're obviously in, in England yourself. Um, also, uh, USA, another tough team, Iran. Um, and then, you know, how do you see Ukraine matching up against these teams? Oh, it's going to be a tough group. I think, well, Ukraine played England in the Euros last summer. They lost 4-0 to them, so it could potentially, uh, that will obviously always be a difficult setup. But I think the England game is actually the last one in the group if Ukraine make it. So that might be a bit, you know, things might have already been decided or it might be for England, that is, and then different things may happen. So we'll see how that uh, unfolds. And then we've got obviously... Um, USA, who, I mean, I've spoken to a lot, I've got a lot of followers who are American slash Canadian, and they've been saying that US aren't, haven't been that impressive during the qualifying campaign. I know they've got a whole host of great stars that, and young players, but apparently they're not as great as, you know, many are, many think that they should be for the squad that they've got. So I think points are available there. And then um, Iran, uh, obviously one of the best sides in Asia. So it's going to be a tough one from that perspective. And, you know, if you get the likes of like Alakian in there, even if Sahadi makes it in the squad somehow towards the end of the year, then it'll be an interesting matchup, especially, you know, with the recent history that Iran and Ukraine have had footballing wise, uh, even though I think the last meeting ever, it was in like 2002 or something. I think Iran actually won that one. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, no, how do you think this this uh, this war has affected Ukrainian football as a whole, not just the national team, but also as a whole? Uh, and how do you think it's going to impact um, uh, Ukrainian football going forward? It's a tough one. 
honestly, because it's been what, 40 plus days when we're talking right now and there's still not been a decision as to what's going to happen to the current sort of UPL and second and third tier seasons. Like, is it going to be just completely voided? Is it going to be cancelled at the halfway stage where everyone played each other once? Or is it going to be just um, decided on where it all ended at the winter break, which I think was like three games into the second round robin cycle, if that makes sense. Uh, I am not 100% sure how the how the different governing bodies will will decide on how that goes. Potentially, it might be from where it ends right now or even potentially voiding it, just because the whole point of having to resolve the season is to ensure the European spots are, uh, make, well, are taken up for next season's competition. But evidently, all those games will have to be played on neutral territory, uh, all this kind of stuff. So it's going to be tough. And there is even doubts, you know, if you're just looking at how the whole situation is unfolding right now, will the UPL or any of the other lower league football come back even in the summer? Or will it have to be postponed until, you know, the war is 100% over and then there's a few months of recovery and all this kind of stuff before that can properly return? So I'm none the wiser person. I think everyone else in Ukraine is the exact same. There's sort of... Obviously, sport's not the utmost priority, but still people, when discussing about it, people just have no idea because there's not really been much indication as to what's happening. Obviously, the big negatives will be um, that a lot of foreign players already have left all their clubs, not permanently, of course, in the in the vast majority of cases. A lot of them have gone on loan, which I'm sure we'll touch on in a minute. But the question is, will they be willing to come back even if the war ends um, what will happen? Will the majority of them get sold in the summer when the special FIFA window yeah. uh, is over? So there's a lot of questions that still need answering. And there is also obviously a few clubs in the lower divisions, like the third tier, have already folded in recent days. Right. Um, Tavria Simferopol, Energia Novokohovka. Like the, they were never like massive clubs or anything, and they probably. Right were like floating just above water anyway before the full-scale invasion happened but then this has sort of taken over to the edge and yeah we've just got to wait and see basically sadly yeah uh, obviously speaking about uh, players going alone uh, Shalb's ID uh, from uh, Zoria Luansk has gone out to to Hungary with uh, Puskas Academia um, what's the situation with him? Yeah, so I mean, he's obviously signed the deal until the end of the summer. And the questions are whether Zoria will still be functioning in the summer and what's going to happen there. Just as I've mentioned, there were rumours that apparently they're close to folding or something like that. However, the club itself has come out to counter those claims and said that there are no plans for the club to fold and Zoria will be there and always will be, that kind of thing. So it's kind of a thing that you have to wait and see. If I'm being completely honest, I think that the majority of foreign players, you know, even including uh, Shahab, will probably end up finding a permanent side somewhere else, sadly. I just think that in the current situation, I don't personally see the war ending that closely. And even if it does, then with the way like how where will the UPL resume it obviously won't be able to resume in Ukraine will it be somewhere like in Turkey or something like that will it be feasible so yeah it's problematic and I could see potentially um, Shahab maybe going somewhere else after the Puskas right. Academia loan ends maybe even another loan you know some of these clubs you know if their contracts yeah. are still running with the current sides they might just get another loan somewhere else and like get the other clubs to pay the wages, etc. However, maybe coming to Ukraine this summer might be slightly premature, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Final thoughts then on this on this group for for Ukraine. How do you think if they do qualify, uh, they'll get on and you know, like predictions against uh, these sides? I think the second place is definitely up for grabs. Um, it's going to be a battle between those three. Those three sides, England, I think, will have this wrapped up just because of how they are. Even when they don't play well, they end up grabbing um, 
lucky wins and all that kind of stuff and just the squad and depth I think it's probably going to be too hard to challenge um, depending on how they are in those two matches and then that Ukraine game if it does happen at the very end of the group stage it might be a different story but on the whole um, I think Ukraine has got a good chance of finishing second whether they will do that is, is another question but yeah tight games I don't think there's going to be any easy ones um, a lot of um, low scoring matches even a few draws I could I could envisage I really appreciate your time uh, Andrew hopefully we'll get you back on in the summer if not then uh, I wish you you all the best um, can you give us any any links that you, you might want to share with the, our audience that could uh, help with the, the situation in Ukraine yeah absolutely thanks for having me on again always great to chat and hopefully when all this is over we'll have a few more iranians back in the upl uh yeah absolutely if anyone wants to donate probably one of the best charities in ukraine one of the most reputable ones you could say is comebackalive.in.ua and they help sort of with different bits and pieces logistically aid um like helmets and vests and all this kind of stuff so if you want to donate head over there i really appreciate it thank you much for coming on nice one cheers Thanks again for listening and thanks to our guests for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to us on all podcast platforms. Follow our socials. We're at GoBizan as well as on our website, GoBizanPodcast.com. We'll see you back here for part two where we speak with some notable experts on England and the United States. Stay tuned. Craig Duncan and you're listening to the Gold Bazaar podcast.